Welcome back, everybody. And uh, welcome to the uh, final topics. So today we are going to uh, summarize the discussions on the variational quantum eigensolvers. And we're going to look at code examples for eventually one qubit and two qubit systems. And we are going also to point back to the lectures which we had last week. And uh, I want to bring up uh, some of the elements which uh, uh, you could eventually use if you want to. Alternatively, if you prefer to use Qiskit, that's also another option. Uh, the uh, project has the possibility to choose different paths. And one of the paths is actually you writing your own code. So what I wanted to discuss in more detail is actually the implementation of the VQE algorithm. And uh, I'm going to use the uh, first exercises or the first parts of the project, which deal more with a uh, vanilla case, a two by two matrix, which can then be easily represented by a one qubit case. And then a uh, four by four case, which can then be represented by a two qubit case. And uh, with that background, it shouldn't be very difficult to actually implement the uh, Lipkin model. Uh, and uh, eventually, if you also want to compare with Qiskit, you can also do that. So uh, the uh, uh, topic uh, after that uh, is going to deal with the quantum Fourier transforms and uh, what was originally proposed as an algorithm for finding the eigenvalues of a system. And this is called the quantum phase estimation algorithm. Now, one of the reasons why we also focus on quantum Fourier transforms is that they play a very important role in uh, the uh, demonstrations and uh, the implementation of uh, Shaw's factorization algorithm, which we will not cover here. So our focus in this course has been on quantum computing. We have not reached uh, quantum machine learning, uh, but that's something which, uh, if you're interested, is something you can always uh, study, but we will not have the time this semester. And as you can see from the final proposed schedule, is that we um, this will be our second last lecture. Next Monday is a, is a public uh, holiday in Norway, so there is no lecture. And then our final lecture is going to be on May 8th, and then we will try to wrap up this material on quantum Fourier transforms and discuss a little bit about the project. That means that we will have the remaining uh, Mondays as days where we can meet and, uh, and dis eventually discuss the projects. So we will not have uh, any organized lectures after May 8th, but we uh, can meet for project discussions if there is a need for that. And uh, the kind of tentative deadline for project number one or just pro, pro, the project, because we will only have one project, is May 31. You should feel free to add topics if you wish to, or if you have other things you would like to explore beyond what is being proposed, I mean, feel free to do that. And uh, the other thing which we need to discuss is an eventual time for the final oral examination. And this could be something which we can organize it in the second half of June, if that fits everybody. Any questions about the, the practicalities for the rest of the semester? Uh, if not, I would like to go back to what we did last week and summarize some of the points and uh, point to the uh, program, which you will also see here, which we are going to discuss now. So let me bring back the slides from last week. And... Uh, if we go back to the top of the slides from last week, there is a uh, overview figure of the variational quantum eigensolver. And uh, one of the things which we have done, if you look at the blue boxes here, is that we have actually taken this Lipkin model and we have transformed it from second quantization. We have encoded that in terms of Pauli operators. And then we have also transformed these poly operators to a, a regrouping in terms of measurement matrices. And that means that we, when we do the actual measurements, we end up uh, calculating uh, expectation values with sigma Z matrices. Because we are assuming now that we have a computational basis, 
which is given for the one qubit state in terms of uh, the state zero and the state one. And these are eigenstates of sigma z. Now, when you then compute the uh, eigenvalues, what we would typically have would be that we initialize the system in, in a set of uh, qubit states. In our case, we are going to look at qubit zero as the state we, by which we initialize the system. And then we can have an ansatz where we prepare uh, the states. And then there's a rotation to a measurement basis. And then there's a measurement of poly strings. Now, the thing which we end up doing is actually to implement a classical algorithm where we calculate the optimal parameters using the variational principle, which means again, that we have to calculate the gradients. And one of the things which we discussed last week was actually the derivation of the analytical expressions for the derivatives. So that means that uh, uh, even though we are going to implement everything on a classical computer, you could now think of when you are doing the quantum uh, computing uh, calculations that the yellow boxes are operations which are done by a quantum computer. And then you would have a, a calculation of uh, these expectation values, which are performed and the standard uh, gradient descent uh, family of methods, which will then be implemented on a classical computer. So uh, this is roughly the uh, calculation of the, uh, uh, of the eigenvalues using the VQE method, the variational quantum eigensolver. Now, one of the reasons why, why this method is, has become so popular is that it combines a mix of the quantum operations on a quantum computer with classical calculations on a traditional computer using traditional quantum no computing al algorithms. And uh, this normally shortens the length of the circuits, which is advantageous in the so-called noisy era, era of uh, quantum computers which means that if we were to use the quantum phase estimation algorithm, often the circuits which we would set up in order to find the eigenvalues would be way too long. And noise would then uh, kick in and uh, spoil many of the measurements which we're going to, uh, which we would like to, to perform. So it means that the VQE is a kind of compromise in this uh, noisy quantum computing era. And it's also a very, how to say, a simple to implement algorithm. And it uses the standard optimization functions based on gradient descent methods. So the example which we have been looking at has been this uh, simple uh, two by two matrix, which we then can represent in terms of a one qubit system. And uh, this is the example which uh, also is at the beginning of uh, the project description. And uh, in this case, we have a pretty simple case which we can diagonalize. So we have a matrix which we often split, or Hamiltonian, which we often split in terms of an unperturbed case and a perturbed case or an interacting case and the non-interacting case, depending on what kind of many body methods you're dealing with. If you're doing many body perturbation theory, you would typically then call this part here for the unperturbed part and this would be the perturbation. Or if you're not dealing with money body perturbation theory, you would simply call this the uh, uh, non-interacting case and HI would be the interacting case. And the thing is that when you're dealing with money body systems, you often try to find uh, parts of the Hamiltonian which can be solved analytically in terms of uh, a selected basis. And this is the case here. So this is basic is pretty similar to what you will do in standard money body methods. So you choose a computational basis which now contains the uh, the zero and the one uh, qubit basic states, but it could be any uh, computational basis. It doesn't need to be this uh, uh, one qubit basis states which we have chosen, and we can rewrite the Hamiltonian then by a simple uh, redefinition of the specific parameters. So we would then have a parameter epsilon and a parameter omega. And then we can rewrite this non-interacting part in terms of the uh, unit matrix and then the uh, sigma z matrix. 
And similarly, we can then rewrite the uh, interacting part in terms of the unit matrix and a sigma Z and a sigma X matrix. So that means that we have prepared the Hamiltonian for uh, operating with the Pauli matrices. And this mimics very much the same situation which we encounter with the Lipkin model. So where we try to rewrite everything in terms of uh, these matrices, which then have computational basis states like zero and one, which are eigenstates of sigma Z. They are not eigenstates of sigma X. So that means that when you are setting up your quantum gates, you need to transform, transform the sigma X matrix into a sigma C matrix. And as you will see down in the slides here, this is normally done by using the Hadamard matrices. So the Hamiltonian can then be rewritten as we've done here. You can introduce a strength parameter and play around uh, with it because this is also a system which exhibits an avoided level crossing. And uh, this is due to the fact that when you switch on interaction, the uh, lowest line state changes character from a representation in terms of uh, largely bit zero to a largely bit one. So that's an example of an avoided level crossing, which also plays a very important role when you are looking at entanglement and how to uh, set up a quantum mechanical system where you can exploit entanglement maximally. So the um, what follows here are the basic operations which we do. So we will prepare the system when we implement the VQE. We are going to prepare the system in the state zero. And we know that uh, a, an arbitrary state uh, on the block sphere, a one qubit state, is given in terms of the rotation around the x-axis and the y-axis. So the state zero is actually a state which is represented by the north pole of a block sphere, whereas the state one is the, uh, is the, uh, is the south pole of the, uh, on, the, on the block sphere. Whereas this is now just a general state a general vector on the uh, on the block sphere, and the Hamiltonian is now rewritten in terms of uh, these constants plus identity matrix, unit matrix, and then the sigma c and the sigma x matrices. And these uh, transformation matrices they um, take this uh, specific form here in terms of a uh, when we use the cosine and sine representation of the rotation matrices which means that when we're calculating derivatives, it's actually pretty straightforward to calculate the derivatives of these quantities. So I'm just gonna scroll down because we went through many of these things before. So a general uh, rotation matrix is given by this Ry. And if we take the derivative of that one, we know that this is gonna be given by this angle gamma uh, times a sigma y and multiply with the original rotation matrix which means that uh, the expression which we need to calculate when we want to implement a gradient descent algorithm is something which will be given by the expression which you see here. So this is a quantity we need to calculate now. So we, in the optimization, we will need the gradients with respect to these parameters. And here I'm just setting up in terms of one angle, but keep in mind now that there will be two angles. So we will have two variational parameters and we may need to calculate two derivatives. The brute force way, which I would recommend implementing for the two qubit case, is simply now to set up uh, a, a new ansatz where you have two qubits, and you assume that both the qubits are initially in the zero state. So that means we will have a tensor product of zero, zero. And each qubit will then have uh, two angles, which give the most general representation of a two qubit state, of a one qubit state, and then that's multiplied or taken the tensor product. So you will have a new state, which then will contain for the two qubit case, it will contain four angles. So that means that you need four derivatives and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a laborious way of setting it up, but this is what normally I would recommend in the, uh, in, in when you are solving the, uh, the the projects here. So we will then have these derivatives plus its emission conjugate. And if you follow this article by Maria Schult, but also many other textbooks, you will then see that this can be rewritten in terms of one half for the Pauli sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma C matrices times the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, 
with an angle phi plus pi half, and then minus an angle phi minus pi half. So the only thing we need to set up in the code is a function for the energy calculation. And then we just calculate the energy for different angles, and that's it. So in the lectures here, you will find what we went through uh, last week is actually the actual derivation of the final expression here. So I'm not going to repeat what we did last week, but this is what you see here is actually the expression which we need to implement when we are setting up the code. So uh, in the lectures, you will also find a reminder on uh, gradient descent methods. So you will, uh, if you wish to, uh, or if you're not too familiar with it, you can look up this. And in the code, which you will see uh, at the end, after all these discussions of different gradient methods, which many of you have already encountered in uh, physics uh, 4155, the um, uh, several examples here when you can just scroll. Uh, if you're familiar with this, you can just skip it. And the thing which you need to do then is actually to implement these for the solution of the uh, one by the two by two matrix and the four by four matrix. So let me just uh, highlight this uh, from the lectures from this week. So here we, ha I, what I've done is actually to implement this for the one qubit case. So let's go through the example here. So this is the original matrix, which I then have uh, uh, rewritten in terms of specific parameters. So I've defined parameters for the uh, uh, non-interacting energies. And then I've set up the non-diagonal matrix elements and the diagonal matrix elements. And in this specific case, I'm now setting up this two by two Hamiltonian and then I diagonalize and obtain the eigenvalues. And then I rewrite it in terms of the identity matrix and the poly X matrix and the poly Z matrix. And uh, in that specific case, what I do now is simply to redefine the Hamiltonian as we discussed in the lectures last week and, and before the Easter break. And then I compute the eigenvalues and then basically we are done. So what you will see now is a very brute force and uh, simple implementation. So when I write these codes for the lectures, the emphasis is more on uh, simplicity and uh, how to say the uh, a code which doesn't contain many tricks so that you can actually follow step by step without having to decode specific tricks. So what you have then is a definition of this uh, rotation matrices, Rx and Ry. So this is done in not the most elegant way, but hopefully it's uh, pretty straightforward and understandable. And in this case, the energy takes in two variables, theta and phi. When you uh, are setting this up in a more elegant way, you would typically transfer an array, which contains the different energies, because you're going to use this function here to actually calculate the uh, derivatives, the gradients, and the expectation values of the energies. So what you will see now is the basis rotation, which we have, which is now given by this uh, original basis state, which we now assume to be the, uh, the qubit zero state. And then we are performing a calculation of the energy where we just take the basis state, we take the uh, transpose and conjugate, and then uh, multiply with the Hamiltonian matrix and multiply with this basis state. So this basis state is just a vector. And similarly, the conjugate and transpose is a vector. And then the Hamiltonian is a matrix which contains the unit matrix and the, the Pauli matrices. Now, my uh, gradient method is uh, pretty simple. And uh, in my case, I haven't uh, put a limit on uh, stopping the iterations. So typically the way you would stop the iterations is that the gradients are approaching zero, uh, but now I'm just simply running for hundred iterations. And one of the things which is going to be very delicate here is actually the implementation of what's called the learning rate. So the learning rate is this parameter, which is uh, set up in gradient descent methods so that you actually avoid the calculation of the, uh, in our case, it will be the, uh, so-called Hessian matrix, which is now a matrix which contains the second derivatives of the energy. 
as a function of these angles theta and phi. So in this specific case, uh, what I'm doing now is simply to put in a parameter for the second derivatives. This param the results will be sensitive to this parameter. Now, one thing you can do is actually to go back and use uh, SciPy functions. And in the SciPy uh, package, there is actually a function which is called minimize. And you can call different methods when you want to minimize. So one is uh, Broyden et al's method. So Broyden, Goldfarber, Fletcher, and I never remember the last name of uh, the, uh, the fourth author. That is normally shortened to BFGS. Shannon, actually, I think it's Shannon, the last one. So this is a, uh, an algorithm which is based on a quasi-Newton Raphson method, which allows you to uh, estimate the second derivative so that you will have a uh, learning rate, which is updated iteration by iteration. What you're implementing is basically Newton Raphson's method for finding the roots of a function. So what we want as a root here is the uh, zeros or the roots of the gradient of the energy. And that gives us an iterative procedure now where we have two variables, the angles theta and phi. And uh, in this specific case, what we're doing now, as you can see here, we calculate the gradients using this analytical formula, which we can do now since we have these rotation matrices in terms of poly matrices. So we calculate the energy for the angle theta plus pi half and theta minus pi half. And then we repeat the same for the angle phi. So if you have more variables, you would actually, you could actually rewrite this in a more elegant way where you just set up the, the gradients as an array over all the variables which you have. And then you would just need one single line. And then you would update here the, the gradients. You would have a learning rate eta times the gradient. And then finally, when this has run through all the iterations, you can then calculate the final energy. And you can see now, this is the energy which I get from the diagonalization. This is the energy which I get from the diagonalization when I rewrite everything in terms of poly matrices. And here you can see the energy which I get from the variational quantum eigensolver, which is basically you driving these gradients to zero here. And you see that the complex part is essentially equal to zero. So you have 10 to the minus 24, which is as it should be, because the energy has to be a real number. And uh, if you don't enforce this basis uh, conjuga conjugations and transpose here, you will not get the, uh, the uh, energy to be a real number. So practically, this number is essentially zero. So you see that you get exactly the same result to uh, quite many leading digits. And uh, this, uh, however, depends very much on your learning rates. So you would have to play around with different learning rates if you want to implement this brute force method. Now, if you uh, uh, want to do this in a more professional way, there are several uh, approaches which you can use them. And uh, one of them is to have an adaptive learning rate using methods like uh, Adam or root mean square propagation, or you can use the uh, standard uh, uh, Adagrad, so these adaptive gradients. You can use uh, gradient descent with momentum. That will still depend on the variable eta. If you have an uh, uh, adaptive learning rate, then you would start with a specific guess for the learning rate, and then you would typically then just run through here and then update the learning rates according to one of these uh, schedules for updating the learning rate iteratively, like uh, the ADAM method or ADAGRAD, adaptive gradient, or root mean square propagation, which are standard methods in the optimization literature. Or since this is a very small problem, uh, you have very few derivatives, you could then use uh, one of the minimization functions which are included with SciPy. And I would actually recommend to use these optimization functions in SciPy. But what you need to send in then is a function which calculates the derivatives and a function which sets up the energies. So you need to define then a function for the derivatives, which is also a smarter way of setting up 
the, uh, the code here. So as I said, this code is meant to be as simple as possible to demonstrate how you can calculate the energies with the variational quantum eigensolver. And uh, the other alternative is actually using Qiskit in order to set up the Hamiltonians, the gates and everything. But I would um, actually recommend uh, writing this yourself. Uh, it's often much better. And then if you want now to uh, uh, go to the two qubit system, which will be the next step, where we also have this simpler four by four matrix, you would then have to set up uh, two additional angles. And then clearly that begs for you uh, setting up the various variables in terms of a vector, and then also setting up the gradients as a vector in terms of the different variational parameters. So for two qubits, you would then have four variational parameters. And this just uh, clearly grows in size with more qubits you have. Now, one thing I also wanted to mention before we uh, move on, if we go back to the slides from last week, the um, one of the things you should do in your codes is actually to change the uh, sigma X and the sigma Y matrices to sigma Z matrices, because when you make the measurements, so we start typically with an answer for a basis, zero, and then with that basis, we uh, are going to calculate expectation values. So we're going to perform a measurement and the uh, states which we have chosen as computational basis states, they are actually eigenstates of the sigma C matrix, but they're not eigenstates of the sigma X matrix. So just keep that in mind because we have chosen a computational basis, which uh, is handy, which in our case, is uh, given by the solution. If we go back a little bit, now I can uh, I can bring that back a little bit later. This uh, states zero and one are the eigenstates of the non-interacting part of the Hamiltonian. And they're also the eigenstates of the sigma C matrix, but they're not the eigenstates of the sigma X matrix. So that means that we need to rewrite the uh, poly X matrix matrix. And in this first exercise, which we have, where we have a two by two matrix, we have a poly X matrix, which we would have to rewrite in terms of a Hadamard multiplied with a Sigma Z matrix and multiplied with a Hadamard. Similarly, you can rewrite a poly Y matrix, which you will need in uh, the uh, Lipkin model. You will need to rewrite that one in terms of also different matrices here. So that means that what you would do then is that you would transform your Hamiltonian from the uh, Sigma Z matrix and the Sigma X matrix, which we had originally with a Hadamard times a Sigma Z times a new Hadamard matrix. And that means in turn that what you need to calculate is actually an expectation value again of the Sigma Z matrix. However, you need now to have the Hadamard transformed basis state. So that means another uh, gate, which is being added to your circuit before you perform the final measurement on the system. So the, um, uh, uh, the case which we had means that you would actually have to rewrite uh, one part of the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in terms of this PCR. Now you can perform a brute force calculation like the one I showed you. If you go back here, you can actually just take the Hamiltonian to be given by this Sigma X matrix, which you have here, uh, when you're just setting up the VQE. But then that means that you're not setting up a quantum circuit. So when you're setting up a quantum circuit, you need to transform the Sigma X matrix, which you have here to a Sigma Z matrix. When you implement the VQE, as I've done here, without thinking of quantum gates and quantum circuits and the measurements which you're doing, this is actually the most straightforward way of implementing the problem. So there are several things to think of when you're setting up the, uh, the final matrix you want to 
implement together with the VQE and setting up the respective quantum gates in order to obtain a final circuit. So remember now that when you are setting up the Hamiltonian you want to use, you would have to rewrite the sigma X matrix in terms of a Hadamard times a sigma C times a Hadamard. Now, if you also look at what we have here, this is one measurement which we are performing. So we are starting with uh, random uh, variables for the angle theta and phi. So remember that theta and phi uh, are angles which are defined from zero to two pi. And uh, this means that we just pick random numbers here. And you would actually have to repeat this many, many times when you're performing your measurements. So it means that you will have to rerun it for many different choices of uh, random angles and then simply compute the final expectation values and then take the average of all the random initializations which you have performed. This is just one specific choice. You will also see that if I, so let us rerun this one and you will see that now for this specific case, depending on the choice of random angles, you will always have some numbers here which differ a little bit. But you see now that even to uh, uh, 10, almost six, seven, eight leading digits, you are basically getting the exact result. The results will, however, depend on your angle theta. So if you make this smaller, you will see now that uh, this is not the result you want. So that means that you need many more. Uh, you need to refine actually this angle, uh, this, no, this learning rate. And this is a parameter in the theory, which depending on the chosen chosen value can give you few, or rather you need few iterations to reach the minimum, or you will need many. So if you make eta very, very small, you move slowly towards the minimum. And after 100 iterations, you may not have moved enough. So that means that you need to increase the number of iterations. However, when you're setting up uh, many, many angles, this is going to be time consuming and you don't want to spend that many iterations on finding the optimal parameters theta. So if I uh, try it with 10 to the minus two here, you will now see that it's getting better. And uh, 10 to the minus one seems to be an optimal learning rate for this specific case. So this is something you would have to play around with. Now, uh, this kind of brute force approach is normally something when you have few angles, which is the case in uh, this specific project, I would normally recommend to use the optim optimization functions which you have in, in scientific Python. Okay, any questions so far to what we have? Things which are unclear or things which uh, you'd like to be discussed a little bit more in detail before we move on to the uh, last topic? So just to repeat, the, the functions which I've set up are pretty simple ones. And uh, when you are setting up this for more angles, uh, you should definitely think of uh, making it more general so that you can have different ansatzes and depending on the number of qubits which you're dealing with. So this is uh, written in the most, in, in the simplest possible way, just to, uh, uh, be able to see what is actually going on. And then you can easily generalize this to more, more qubits. And as I said, uh, you can implement a stochastic gradient descent if you wish to. And uh, every epoch then, if you're familiar with stochastic gradient descent, would represent a measurement. And the uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent would then need a method which uh, finds the learning rate in an adaptive way. Alternatively, since the dimensionalities here with a number of uh, angles and variational parameters, which you get since you have a certain number of angles is not that big, you can actually use the standard methods like uh, the minimization methods based on these quasi-Newton methods, like uh, Powell's method, Nelda Mead, or the Broiden uh, et al. methods. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'm going to switch over to the uh, 
last topic, which we are going to look at. And this deals with uh, quantum Fourier transforms. And the reason why we are interested in quantum Fourier transforms is that they uh, are widely used in the quantum computing and quantum information uh, theories. And the, uh, uh, it formed the basis for the quantum phase estimation algorithm, which was a standard algorithm for finding eigenvalues of um, Hamiltonian problems or for ma general matrices, which we want to diagonalize. And it's also the basis for Shor's algorithm, which we will not discuss in this course. But let's now look at the basics of quantum Fourier transforms and remind ourselves a little bit about uh, Fourier transforms in general. And in particular, the discrete Fourier transforms. And this is gonna be the last topic this semester. So let me bring up the uh, whiteboard. So as I said, the uh, last topic which we are going to, to address is that of quantum Fourier transforms, which we shortened to QFT and the quantum phase algorithm or quantum phase estimation. And this was the original algorithm which was proposed for finding the eigenvalues. So we're gonna label this as a QPE from here and now on uh, algorithm or algorithms, sorry. So in order to do that, we need to remind ourselves a little bit about uh, Fourier transforms and uh, the uh, discrete Fourier transform is a quantity which we, many of you may have encountered. So let's start with a discrete Fourier transform. And you will see that that one is defined in terms of a vector Y of K, which is then given by a sum and I have n such states, which we are going to define in just in a while here. And we are summing from n minus one, and then we have a basis xj, and this is multiplied with e to the two pi and i, and then i is the imaginary number, jk divided by n here. So xi's, the, or the xj's, they are complex numbers, in general. And we have defined this J to run from zero up to N minus one. And then we have similarly the Y case. They're also complex numbers. where k now runs from zero, one, up to n minus one. So just to show you uh, an example here on how you would use this uh, kind of discrete Fourier transform, let's now assume that we have defined this xj. So we have uh, n equal to two, and we have two values. So we have one and two here. So that means that n is equal to two here. So what this means is that we have x zero, equal to one and x one equal to two. So this is not a very fancy example, but this is more meant as a way to remind you of how we use such a Fourier transform. And uh, we are going to implement this as a quantum Fourier transform. And you will see that this is a very compact way by which we can encode information and make a transformation to a new basis set. So the, uh, uh, for k equal to zero, what we have then is that y0, if we use the formula which we have here, is now given by one over square root of two, obviously. And then I have, because then we have a e to the two pi and then i, and then I have j equal to zero and k equal to zero divided by two, so that's just one. 
So that means I get one over square root of two here. And then I have plus two divided by square root of two. And this is the same as three divided by square root of two. So y zero uh, with k, sorry, this should actually be k equal to zero, not k zero, but k equal to zero. And that means that I can now define uh, these different states. I could do the same thing with k equal to one. And then I would have a y1, which would then be given by one over square root of two. And now I have also uh, j equal to zero. So this is one over square root of two. But in the next case, I have a j equal to one and I have k equal to one. So I get e to the two pi, oh, sorry, not that one, but plus, I get two divided by square root of two. And then I have e times two pi i, and then I have j equal to one and k equal to one. So that gives me one and divided by two. So this is simply i times pi. And we know that that is going to be equal to minus one. And so what I get then is actually one divided by square root of two minus two over square root of two divided over square root of two. So that gives us minus one divided by square root of two. So this is the new representation which we get. Now, if we now move back to uh, quantum physics and we want to define a quantum transformation or quantum Fourier transformations, what we need to remind ourselves now about is the representation of some basic states. So if we now look at the quantum Fourier transform, What we have then is a basis state, psi. If we now look at what we have done earlier, so this could be given by a sum over j equals zero. And then I have a basis with n states. And then I have some coefficient a of j. And then I have some basic states i here. So this is, should be j. And uh, uh, depending on how many of these states I have, so J could now be given by a set of basis states where I could have a state one, zero, zero. So that contains these states. It could have the next one, which is zero, one, zero, down, down to zero. And then it continues all the way till the element N, where we then have one here. So this is one possible representation of uh, all the possible states which we have. And then I can make an expansion in terms of these basis states. So the discrete Fourier transform uh, starts with this kind of idea and then tries to find the coefficients uh, which we have for transformation from one basis state to another basis state. So a discrete Fourier transform in this specific case if we now write it down here, is now trying to map uh, the states so that I now get a transformation from k equals zero. So this is going to be my new state of n minus one. And I'm going to be coefficients b of k multiplied with a new basis k here. And this coefficients b of k are going to be given by one over square root of n. And I have a sum over j equals zero of n minus one. And then I have these coefficients a of j, which I wrote up earlier, and then multiplied with e to the two pi of i, multiplied with j of k and divided by n here. So it's useful to think of uh, this orthogonal basis, which we have, and you see that the basis J here is an orthogonal basis. And we know that if I take the state I with a state J and they are different, then this is going to be equal to zero. So the uh, uh, original state, which I defined the state Psi here is actually now given in terms of these coefficients A of I multiplied with I here. 
And this ends up being something like this, like A0, A1, down to A of N minus one. So this starts with zero here. And if we now think of a, uh, an operator which acts on this, so this is just to remind you quickly of what we have seen before. So with a linear operator, we will typically have an operator which acts on these states of A of I of I. And this is going to be given by a sum of A I. And then we have this operator acting on the states of I here. So what we're going to do after the break here is to look at some simple examples. We're going to look at a two qubit state, and then we're going to generalize this representation and see how we can implement this in terms of gates. And then uh, uh, in the last lecture, we are going to link the quantum Fourier transform, which is going to be a tool for us uh, in order to estimate the eigenvalues of a uh, quantum mechanical many body problem or find the eigenvalues of a eigenvalue problem. So uh, what I did here was simply to give you just a quick reminder of uh, some of the basics of Fourier transforms. And then after the break, we are going to implement this explicitly for the quantum Fourier transform and show how we can represent uh, a set of uh, qubits in terms of a Fourier transform and what kind of operations this actually leads to. So let's uh, take a small break and be back in 15 minutes, but feel free to ask questions if you have some. I'm going to pause the recording in the meantime. So what I did before the break was actually to give you some definitions, but I didn't say exactly what a quantum uh, Fourier transform is. I just brought up some, uh, some definitions of uh, uh, transformations, a discrete Fourier transform, and I mentioned something about a quantum Fourier transform. Uh, but I mainly focused on this uh, the standard discrete Fourier transform. So what is a quantum Fourier transform? So the QFT, if we wish to stay uh, in, a, in general terms, is actually a linear operator. And you will see that soon, is a linear operator which um, transforms, transforms, let me just write this down here, transforms an orthonormal basis which now could be defined in terms of a set of vectors. And we are coming back to what these vectors can be in some actual examples. One up to some K here. And this continues all the way up to N minus one. So this is now an uh, orthonormal basis. And it transforms them as follows. So we can have a basis J. So this is our original basis. And that get transformed via this operation, which we defined before, which is actually given by this uh, discrete uh, Fourier transform. And it has a sum over K equals zero up to N minus one. And it has the E to the I to pi. And then I have J times K divided <laughs> By, by n and multiplied with a basis k. So the QFT transforms a state forms a state which we can label as a state V of a quantum system. into another state which we can label as a W. 
So that means that we have, we go from the state V to the state W. And this state V and the other state W, they have their own expansions in terms of uh, different coefficients. So we can, this is actually like the state Psi, which we defined before the break. So this V is now given in terms of its own uh, basis. So we have assumed this orthogonal basis. So we have a J equal zero up from N to minus one. And then we have the expansion coefficients V of J. And this is now multiplied with these states J, where these states J are the same uh, orthonormal basis states, which we have started with. And then we would have a state W. And this is now given in terms of a new expansion of J equals zero, sorry, K equals zero, just to make the difference here. So let's just write K equal to zero. And up to N minus one. But now we have coefficients WK multiplied with the basis states K. Now, the basis states J and K are the same. So what we are using now is actually the same starting orthonormal basis. But now via the Fourier uh, transforms, so we have this discrete Fourier transform, is the one which actually gives us these uh, new states W. So the discrete Fourier transform and then we would now have a coefficients WK. So which are the coefficients which we have here? These coefficients are now given by the discrete Fourier transform and that is defined as one over N of the sum over J equal to zero of n minus one, and then I have my w, that one, that this will contain the coefficients v of j from the original basis v, and then multiplied with e to the two pi of i j k divided by n. So I can now define these coefficients in terms of the original V of J, the expansions, and the basis states with J, which we have defined as an orthonormal basis state. So that means that the, if we now look a little bit closer at this, we are going to see that we can actually redefine this mapping as a matrix multiplied with a vector. But let's look at some examples first in order to get some kind of feeling of what this is about. So let's look at an example where we now look at two qubit states, two qubits. And these states are states which we are going to label uh, in the following way. So we can now have a state which we define as zero, zero, which is often defined as a state zero. So one, zero, zero. So sometimes we would typically label this as a zero state. And then we have the state uh, zero, one, which is simply zero, one, zero, zero. So these are our basis states. So this would, is something which we can also label as a state one. And then we have the state one, zero. So this is just a tensor product of two qubits. And then we have zero, zero, one, zero. And this is something which we could label as a state two. And finally, we have the state one, one, which is given by zero, zero, and one. So this is an orthonormal basis. We will often also label this as a state three. <coughs> so if we now think of uh, uh, the original state, we could now think of that as a linear combination of uh, the, the given coefficient. So if we have an original state psi here, this can now be written out in terms of a set of parameters, which we are going to call Vj multiplied with this basis states i, sorry, j. And we have a sum from j equals zero up to n minus one. 
which in our case is equal to pre. So that will be given now by a V0 multiplied with the state one, zero plus a V1 multiplied with the state one, plus a V2 multiplied with the state two, plus a V3 multiplied with the state three. Where now these states are actually given by like the one, one, this will be the state one, zero, et cetera. So this would be the coefficients which we would get. And that means that that specific state, this psi, is given now in terms of V0, of V1, of V2, and V3. So these are just coefficients of this specific expansion which we have chosen. Now, when we now make the uh, uh, Fourier transform of this specific state, what we would get then is a parameter. If we now go back to this definition, which we put up here. So we could now rewrite this in terms of a, a new basis, this basis W, which we have here, which is given in terms of these coefficients WK multiplied with the original basis. And that would now contain also the VJ parameters, et cetera, et cetera. So if I now, uh, go down here, then what I would find is that these new parameters, WK, are now going to be given by one over square root of four, which gives us a factor of a half. And then I have a sum from J equals zero up to three here. And then I have the original parameters, V of J, multiplied with E of I of two pi of J of K divided by four. And this is now multiplied with the original basis J, where this original basis J is my orthonormal basis, which we have put up here. So this is the basis zero, one, two, three, or zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So uh, if I now write this out, and I look at the coefficients here, W zero, this is going to be equal to a half. And then I'm going to get V zero. And then since uh, K is equal to zero, I'm just gonna get zeros here. So it will contain V one plus V two plus V three. And this is obviously multiplied with the different states. So I would have to be a little bit careful here now because so the coefficients are given, so this W case, I should actually re just a moment. Let me rewrite it because this is going to be given by one half. And then I have V zero multiplied with zero plus V one multiplied with one plus V two multiplied with two plus V three multiplied with three. So this would be the coefficients. And if I now think of the, uh, the state which I'm getting, this uh, state uh, psi, that will now contain a linear combinations of all these different coefficients here. Okay, so this state, uh, the, the WK which I get is now going to be given by this linear combination. I can then, uh, if I now move on and look at W1, so that's going to be given by one half, and then I'm going to have a V0 multiplied with zero. I get plus V1, and this is multiplied with E to the I of pi half, multiplied with the state one. I get plus a V2 here, multiplied with E of I of pi, multiplied with the state two, plus a V3, multiply with e to the three i of pi half and multiply with the final state three here. And then we can continue along these lines and we will get a w2 here, which is given by, I'm just listing up the final expressions which we're getting, of zero plus a v1 of e of i times pi, plus, and this is multiplied with one, plus a V two 
multiply with e of i of 3 pi i, multiply with 2 plus a v 3, multiply with e of 3 i, so this should be 3 i pi, and I think this is i, and this should be 6 i pi, multiplied with 3. And finally, I have the last state of this last coefficients W3 here, which is simply one half multiplied with V0 of one of zero plus uh, V1 of E of three I of pi half. And then it's multiplied with uh, the state one plus a V2 of E to the three i times pi and this is multiplied with two here and then the final one is v3 of e to the nine nine i of pi half so this is a nine pi half multiplied with three so what i see now is that the different coefficients which we are looking after uh, take now the following values if we think of the mapping of now the, uh, the states. So I can actually rewrite uh, everything which we have. So we can rewrite this. The mapping in terms of a matrix, in terms of of a matrix so that the when I perform the mapping from the state which we now look at if we now go back here and we look at the original mapping which we did from v to w so this specific mapping here we can actually rewrite that in terms of a matrix times the original vector so it means that the mapping which we are looking at from V over to the state W, that is now going to be given by the following. It's going to be given by a matrix. So V goes over to a matrix F multiplied with the original basis, which we had. So I'm gonna write this as a term J here, which is the basis we set up. And that's going to be given in terms of a sum from k equals zero up to three in our case, n minus one equal to three. And then we have a matrix f j of k multiplied with a basis k. And this can be written out as, and in our case, we just have a four by four matrix <coughs> of e to the two pi of i, and this is multiplied with a zero times zero. So that's the first element divided by N. So this is actually just one. And then I have uh, the next one, which is also one because I have E of two pi of I with zero multiplied with one divided by N. And then I have E of two pi of one multiplied with zero and two and divided by n, and then I have e of two pi of i of zero and three divided by n. And then the matrix just goes on. So I would have a two pi of i, and in this case, I have also zero, so one zero divided by n. And then I have my e of two pi of i, and one times one divided by n. And then I have e of two pi of one, times two divided by n, and then I have e of two pi of i of one times three divided by n. And you see now the pattern, this becomes a two pi of i of one times two divided by n, which is equal to two of e to two pi of i, and then I have a two times two one divided by n, Sorry, this should be zero actually. So this is two times zero. And then I have E of two pi, two times two divided by N. 
of e of two pi of two times three divided by n. And the final one, which is two pi i, and this is three zero. So this obviously gives zero. And then I have e of two pi of i, and then I have three and one divided by n of e of two pi times two times three divided by n. And the final one, which gave us nine, is three times three divided by nine. And you recognize that one, the last one, as the parameter which we had here. And uh, this now uh, is multiplied with the original basis states which we had, which were zero, one, two, and three. And these states were the same as the zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So if you perform the multiplications here, you will then see that these coefficients contain all these specific values which we were looking after. So it means that this matrix Fj of k has elements which are given by the exponential. And then I have two pi ij of k. So i is the imaginary number divided by n here. So one thing which can be useful to see is actually the way we could represent a Hadamard gate, just as an example. Uh, but just keep in mind that, so this can easily be extended to more than just two qubits. So if we have uh, three qubits, this is gonna be an eight by eight matrix. So what we're having now is just a transformation of uh, the basis states from an orthogonal basis. And we perform a mapping from one state to another state. This is gonna be pretty useful for us when we now want to represent the states. But let's look at another example here before we move on. <coughs> so we could actually represent the Hadamard matrix as a simple Fourier transform. So the Hadamard matrix is nothing but a simple Fourier transform is a Fourier transform where we can now rewrite the Hadamard matrix H, which is given as one over square root of two. And we can rewrite that in terms of an E of two pi. And then we have zero times zero divided by two. And then we have, so this is with an n equal two actually. So this is just a one qubit case. So we have the state zero and one. And then I have an e of two pi, zero times one divided by square root of two. And then I have e of two pi of one times zero divided by two. And then I have e of two pi of one times one divided by two. So this is for the case n equal to two. So we would have two states. In the previous case, we had four states. The states zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, which we relabel as the states zero, one, two, and three. But this is for the case where we have only two qubit states. So this is a one qubit system. And that means that we have two states, state zero and state one. And you see now that when we write this out, this is nothing but one over square root of two. So all the cases where we have zero in the exponent just give us one, one, one. And the final case is e of two pi. And I should remember now that there is an imaginary number here, i here, of i and i. Sorry for forgetting that. And that means that I get the i of pi, which is actually e minus one. So the uh, Hadamard uh, gate or the Hadamard matrix is simply given in terms of a uh, Fourier transform. So you could now think of uh, rewriting the Hadamard gate in terms of a quantum Fourier transform where you have the original basis and then you act with H on a specific state. So you can now see that the new state W, which we defined 
would now be given by the Hadamard matrix multiplied with the original basis. And we could think of now the original basis as just given by zero and one. So this is just a very simple way of rewriting the Hadamard transformation in terms of a quantum Fourier transform, which is pretty neat. So um, if we now look at the Fourier transform of an arbitrary state, so let's just note that, note that the Fourier transform. So today I want to go through the basic definitions. And the next time we are going to use these basic definitions to construct gates and to demonstrate the quantum phase estimation algorithm, which will be the final topic in this course. So note that this Fourier transform of an arbitrary state And when I say the Fourier transform, I'm now thinking of the quantum Fourier transform of an arbitrary state. State is given by the following, is given by so I would now have my uh, given arbitrary state. So I have a sum from J equals zero to N minus one. And let's now just uh, define just an arbitrary state X with a linear expansion X and the state basis state J. This is given as a transformation from J equals zero to N minus one. And I have my X J. And this is multiplied with the sum of a k equals zero up to n minus one and multiplied with this factor one over square root of n. So let's rewrite everything in here. Two pi of i j k divided by n divided by square root of n and then multiply with the state k like this. So this is essentially what we've been doing here. Now we can rewrite this one in terms of k equal to zero to n minus one. And then I would have this in terms of one over n and then a sum over j equals zero up to n minus one. And then I would have my states xj of e to two pi of ijk divided by n and multiply with the basis states k. Now, this is nothing but the coefficients from k equals zero up to n minus one. So I would have the coefficients y of k, which are these ones, multiplied with the basis k. So this is the, uh, uh, an arbitrary state is then being transformed in this specific way. So it's useful then uh, when you uh, work with qubits to use a binary basis. Well, let's just continue a little bit with these definitions. It is useful when uh, working with qubits to define a binary basis. To if you use a binary basis. So that means that we have a basis of states zero, one, etc., up to some state of two of n minus one. So we have in total n equal two to the power of n where n, little n is now the number of qubits which we have. And that means that you can write a given state. This state uh, J, or K as we called it, in a binary representation. In a binary representation. So this is often the compact way by which we would do it. So we would have a state J, which would now be given by some qubit one 
J2 up to J of N, which then means, which means that we would have a state which goes like J1, J2 up to some J of N, which is given by J1 times two to the power of N minus one plus J2 times two to the power of N minus two. And then we go to the very end here. And this is given by Jn times two to the power of zero. And we would normally rewrite this in terms of the following. So we would have an M equal one up to N here. And then we have this J of M times two of N minus M. That's a very compact way of writing uh, the qubits. So if we now have a basis where we have uh, J, where one of these J's, J I's is equal zero or one. These are the two possibilities since we've chosen a binary basis. Then we can rewrite a given state like zero. We start with qubit zero. We have J two up to a, a qubit J N times two of uh, N minus one here. This is another representation. So this could be written out as an M equal one up to N. And then I have a J M of two minus M here. That's another way of representing, which, we, which, we can, which is often used actually. So we can use this notation uh, to show an equivalent representation of the Fourier transform, which is normally called the product representation. And this is a kind of representation which uh, we will use uh, as an alternative to the one which we defined up here. So this is the one type of representation, but it's actually pretty common to actually rewrite everything in terms of a binary, using a binary basis, because we think of the individual qubits as taking values zero and one. So what you saw here is one way of representing it. And all the operations which we did here is to represent one specific representation of the states. But then we can actually switch over to a binary representation in order to get a more compact way of writing it. So we can use this type of notation. We can use this notation to introduce what is normally called the product representation. Use this notation to introduce in an equivalent representation of the Fourier transform, which then bears the name, the product uh, representation. Uh, to show, let me just write this down here, an equivalent representation of the Fourier transform and this uh, equivalent transformation here transform called the product representation So what we're going to do now is using this kind of representation, we are going to take the state J, which now is transformed into one over two to the power of N divided by two. So what I'm doing now is simply to rewrite the number of uh, states which I have. So remember now that the number of states is given by, so this factor here, let me just quickly remind you of that we had one over the fact the, the square root of n, which is now equal to one divided by the square root of two to the power of little n. So little n is now the number of uh, uh, possible states which I can make or the number of qubits which I'm having. And uh, 
the total number of states is two to the power of number of qubits. So if I have one qubit, this is one over square root of two. If I have two qubits, no, four qu two qubits and n is equal to four, because I can actually, no, sorry. If I have two qubits, this is two to the power of two, sorry. And then I have the square root of it. So you see now that uh, this becomes one. So this is just simply one over two of n half here. So I can rewrite uh, this specific linear combination, which I had, with k equals zero. And now the total number of states is two over n minus one. And then I have my e of two pi of i. And then I have my j of k divided by two n multiplied with the basis state k, which I'm now going to represent in terms of these um, binary representations. So let's rewrite this one. So this becomes equal to one over two of n divided by two. And then I'm going to have this sum, which now runs over k1, k2, up to the final kn. And these k1, k2, up to kn, take only binary values. So I'm replacing my summation now over this binary representation. And this contains now a sum of E of two pi of I multiplied with J. And then I have a sum here, which runs from M equal one up to N. So this is just a simple rewrite. And I have these coefficients K of M and then I have two of n minus m divided by two of to the power of n. And then I have this product of the states k1, k2, etc., up to kn. So what I'm doing now, I'm simply rewriting my basis states k in terms of this binary representations, which we put up either this representation or we can use this representation. So this is very much up to us now, whether we want to use the integers or floating point numbers. Now, this is something which we then can rewrite as a tensor product of all these states. So we can now rewrite this one in terms of the following expression. So this is one divided by two of n half. And then I have a sum over all this k1, k2 up to kn, which take values either zero or one. And then I'm going to rewrite this as a tensor product, which I write like this. So as a tensor product of all the k1s, tensor product k2, tensor product kn, et cetera. And this contains now the sum from m equal one up to n. And then I have e of two pi ij of km multiplied with two minus n. And this is then multiplied with the states km here. So this symbol here is just a way to rewrite the uh, previous expression in terms of the tensor products. So I can then uh, rewrite this in terms of one over two of n half. And then I have a tensor product of m equal to one up to n here. And then I'm simply putting in the sums of a k of m elements from in zero and one. These are the values it takes. And then I have e to the two pi of i of j, k, m, multiply with two minus m, and then it multiply with the state k of m. And if I look at the sum here, uh, this sum just runs over two values. So this is simply the tensor product of two of n half, of m equal one up to n. And then I have two states now. So I have a zero state 
So I start with the Km equal to zero plus the E of two pi of I of J. So K is equal to one and multiplied with two to the power of minus M and then multiplied with the qubit state one. So this is now a way to rewrite this Fourier transform in a binary basis where I have now chosen the states zero and one. So this gives me a slightly more compact way of writing out uh, these specific states. Now, one thing you should note is also the following. So if I take the exponential, so note that. So if I take the exponential of two pi of i, and then I sum of L equal one to N, and I have a sum of a coefficient J of L of two N minus L minus M. This is something which I can rewrite. And I'm just giving you the answer here as a two pi of I. And this is a sum over quantity T equal one up to M of J N minus M plus T of two or minus T here. And that can be rewritten in terms of the exponential of a two pi of I, and then multiply with this zero of J of N minus M plus one. And then I have a J of N minus M plus two and down to the state J of N here. So it means that I can actually rewrite my transformation J here, which um, goes over to uh, this one over two of N half, and then a tensor product from M equal one to N. And I can actually rewrite that one as zero, plus the exponential, and let's just put this down here, the exponential of two pi of i, and then the state zero of j of n minus m plus one dot of j of n minus m plus two. And this goes all the way up to j of n. And this is then multiplied with one, and finally, I have an end of parenthesis here. So what that means is that I can actually rewrite in this basis here, I can rewrite my states as a zero state plus e to two pi of i of zero of jn multiplied with the state one. This is multiplied with zero plus e to two pi of i of zero of j n minus one of j n. And this is multiplied with one and multiplied with all the states up to, so this should have actually j n exactly. So these are the different representation of the states which I have of e to the two pi of i, and then I have multiplied with zero, and then I have j1, j2, up to jn, multiplied with the qubit state one here. So this gives a very compact uh, representation, and this is also multiplied with one over two of n half here. So this gives a very compact representation of a, a given state. So what we're going to look at now is an example with a two qubit case, where we now look at the original representation and then on the binary representation. Two qubit states with a binary representation and the standard representation. To, in order to show the, the uh, compact way by which we now can represent given states here. 
So what I did here was simply a, a, uh, to introduce a more compact way of representing the qubit states. Uh, many of these things are described in standard textbooks known as in quantum computing. So you can do the traditional representation, but what normally is done is actually to represent everything in terms of a binary representation. So that means that if we look at a binary representation, if you now take the state J, which we defined as a state three, this is the standard representation which we opted for, which is the same as the state one one. So if we stay with this qubit two qubit case in binary, what we have then is the representation of J1 dot J2. And this is also going to be given by one one. So it means that qubit one is given by the state one and qubit two is given by the state two. So the standard representation is actually to encode it in terms of a state three. And the qubit represent or the binary representation is actually one where we keep this specific way of presenting the states. And since we only have a, a two values for one qubit state, either zero and one, this is something which lends itself to a more compact representation. So the standard one is where we have put a label on the states, whereas the uh, a binary representation is actually the one where we now represent a given state in terms of uh, its qubits. So just to ring this out here, this is something we can put in parentheses. This is the binary representation. So clearly if you have a three qubits case with three qubits, then we uh, have a tensor product, which leads to a state with uh, eight uh, single particle states, which we can have. So with n equal to three, then we would have a state if we now take the tensor product of zero times zero with zero, that is something which now becomes equal to one. And then we have seven zeros here. So it should be a seven zero here. And we would call this a state zero. In a binary, so this would be the standard representation. In a binary representation, this would be given now by J1, J2, and J3. And this is given by 0, 0, 0. So we need the three bits in order to represent that specific state. Now, next week, uh, or not next week, but the week thereafter, we are going to look at the, uh, the examples on what this means and just decode it in terms of the uh, two qubit case and the three qubit case. We are going to look at uh, how we can set up a quantum circuit for quantum Fourier transforms. And with that, we are going to move over to the quantum phase estimation algorithm and use this machinery to see how we can actually extract the eigenvalues of a uh, eigenvalue problem. So today was more to give you a kind of a form formalism of the Fourier transforms and how these relate to the standard discrete Fourier transforms. I'm assuming that you have seen uh, the theory of Fourier transforms before. That's an assumption I had, I had to make. And this is going to give us a very compact way by which we can represent a transformation from one state to another state. So as of now, uh, it's not so easy to see the uh, importance of uh, this type of formalism, but hopefully next time when we meet and when we go through the quantum phase estimation algorithm, you will see the usefulness of uh, uh, implementing these quantum Fourier transforms. So it's not only used for the calculations of eigenvalues, but it's also used in, for instance, Shor's algorithm. And uh, quantum Fourier transforms uh, are actually the uh, form actually one of the important uh, quantum computing algorithms. And they can be represented by uh, their own circuits for performing this quantum Fourier transforms. And as I said, the uh, 
if you look back at what we defined in the very beginning or in the beginning of this lecture, we can actually represent a mapping from one state to another one in terms of a matrix, which then represents the coefficients in the Fourier tran in the discrete Fourier transform. And that gives us a very compact way of uh, seeing uh, how we can represent different states. And these are, since they're given by these uh, exponentials, they can actually be rephrased in terms of rotation matrices. And rotation matrices are some of these uh, uh, mathematical expressions which allow us to set up quantum circuits and the realization of a quantum circuit in terms of a quantum Fourier transform. Remember now that the way you would typically uh, transform a state is by performing some kind of rotation. As we did with a general qubit state, which is given by a rotation around, around the x-axis and the y-axis. So this is one of the uh, kind of more important aspects of what we are done today, is that all these uh, Fourier transform coefficients, which you see, they can be related to specific uh, rotation matrices. And this is something we will see next time when we're going to set up the quantum circuits. Now, the chapters 6.2, 6.3, and 6.4 of the Hunt's textbook give you a very much hands-on approach to these type of operations. So this concludes today's uh, lecture.